My name is Dante Luna. Everything you're about to experience is a result of taking myself seriously. I'm just a regular kid from the neighborhood with a strong imagination and a zest for life. The question I get asked the most is, you know, what exactly do I do? Basically, the best way to uh, summarize it, I, I make videos and I take pictures. That's what opens a lot of the doors for me. To work at the pizza shop with this model. Yeah. I was a chef, you know, club chef, club, you know, sandwich <laughs> chef, steak and cheese chef, and MJ's pizza and subs. Dante was the delivery dude, and I'm hearing that he's doing like music videos and filming. Dante, it's like he's a fucking delivery dude. Like, <laughs> one of the biggest inspirations for me and Kiefer, I think, in just pushing 31 Productions was like, you know, if Dante, the delivery dude from MJ's can do it, <laughs> so can we. I'm also an entrepreneur because I'm constantly creating jobs for myself. I think being an entrepreneur is a creative job in itself. There's my freelance life and there's my creative life. Um, my freelance life is where I get hired to create and then my creative life is when I create for my own good. I hope my story can encourage others to believe in themselves and to pursue the songs of their heart. The voice in our head that's either encouraging us or breaking us down is something we can take control of. Inner dialogue is real and we can use it to build confidence. We need confidence to build our dreams. I am Zordon. And I am Jason from the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And uh, man, we're here to support our boy, Dante Luna. Dante Luna. The legendary man behind the camera who in the film world, usually are the unsung heroes, and Dante Luna is that man. That guy with a camera is like a Greek god. I don't know if they ever had cameras, but if they did, they, they would have been named Dante Luna. That's right, they should have come after him. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm gonna make this announcement. I know I probably got some real runners out here. Uh, yeah, look at us. Don't whoop my ass too bad. <laughs> I'm not a runner, I'm just about the healthy side of it, so please take it easy on me. People, we are out here for healthy That's shit. That's right. Uh, yeah. hey, hey, hey. We're working out, so uh, okay. if you're not about this workout or this physical fitness, I suggest you take your unhealthy ass somewhere else. <laughs> I'm going to go up here and stretch, and as a group, man, let's just do it together. I'm in Boston, so I want to do what Boston does. Let's get this right yes, a, a quick one. A quick yes. stretch and go, man. Uh, we out here, brother. No, if I pull it, I pull it. Let's get a stretch so you don't pull your hammy. I'm a motherfucking legend. I'm. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm a legend. Oh my god. Oh my god. If I die, I'm a legend. You was real serious about this picture, hey? I take a look at that right here. Oh yeah, it's a happy picture. That's what I, you meditate, right? If you come out of meditation, you'd be real happy. Like, that giggly and shit. <laughs> See that? Yo, but was you really floating? No, stupid. There's a, there's a pillow. And I'm saying, but was a floating there's pillow. There's a pillow, man. That's they not floating. They got flowing carpets. Come on, man. Of a flowing pillow. Look at that. There's a pillow. I'm sitting on the floor on a pillow. My first video that I ever worked on was a music video. It was music that um, forced me to want to create visuals. You know, I had done... Uh, I've been taking pictures since I was younger, but you know, actually wanting to do something creative, it, it, it wanted, it wanted to create something that that I knew the world was gonna see. That I had every intentions on sharing with everybody, with strangers. Um, music videos was the first route that I went with. It's a misconception about hip hop. Hip hop is the total artistic expression of the boy or the girl. People think hip-hop just created rappers. No, it didn't. It created journalists, it created directors, it created designers, it created people such as yourself, cameramen, it created audio, it created visual, it created sculptors, it created teachers and educators. So a lot of the aspects of hip-hop are being missed. Right now, we just got to Fright Kingdom. Um, it's the location for today's production. A shot where she uh, takes it from the brain and slaps it on 
right in front of the camera. So this spot is gonna be, the shot's gonna be there. It's gonna come from the brain. And it's laying in front of the camera like that. Like. All right, so D, you're killing her, Dolly. Yep, Sasha, it's on you. Oh my god. <laughs> that just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> it was Earl, bro! He just killed her! No, 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 My name is Dante Luna, I'm 27 years old, and I really, uh, I really want to live a long life. I want to ask you for your advice. Like, how do I get to your age without, uh, without losing my mind? It may be too late. To, uh, <laughs> uh, you have to have, I think, a belief in yourself. You have to be willing to fight for your ideas and your philosophy. You can't let people steal from you. You have to be prepared to defend your honor, your ideas, and the people around you. I decided to pursue a career in something I didn't go to school for. I went to school for, for global studies and philosophy. And not to discredit anything I learned there, I don't think philosophy was meant to be a career path. Um, philosophy helped me appreciate um, my work and how my work affects the community. This is my, my principal in uh, middle school, but middle I know school. we all knew that he had a gig at Fenway. What do you remember about me, Mr. Corcoran? He, he was the man, and you knew he was going to be here. He could operate like the devil. He really could. He was good. Creative is a better word. You were creative. Thank you, man. Dr. Luna, it. yay! <laughs> Wrestling. Wrestling for me is uh, my favorite form of entertainment. Um, I've loved wrestling since I was a kid, from as far back as I can remember. Um, wrestling has always been in my life. There's always been a, a new story every week. Yes, Dante Luna. You are speaking to Matt Hardy. Not the normal Matt Hardy you know from days have gone past, like the Attitude Era. You are speaking to the man with the broken condition. Dante, you are a very loyal soldier in my great war. And for that, I will bring you into my platoon and I'm going to put you on my battlefield. And I need you to help me win this great war. I make you a sergeant. Go to war, Matzel. Cue up the extraordinary xylophone and march into war, Dante. So I got the attention of a Mudo newspaper a few years ago, and uh, they asked me to come and help them uh, with some entertainment at their family festival here at Fenway Park. And um, at the time, and still, I was working on a lot of Comic-Con projects, and my first idea was to bring cosplayers. So we brought cosplayers to Fenway Park, and uh, I was able to bring wrestling. You know, Bo Douglas and uh, the Bell Time Club, you know, they helped me put together a show, a uh, wrestling show at Fenway Park, which was the first wrestling show at Fenway since 1969. I love wrestling so much. It's something that's entertained me 
my entire life. And most of the people there who witnessed wrestling at Fenway, uh, they were shocked by it. You know, they, they were surprised to see it. Most of the people have never seen wrestling before, live wrestling, which was really special for us to be able to provide that experience to the community and provide that experience to uh, you know, the people of my neighborhood. I love Fenway. Fenway is uh, a Boston landmark. It's Boston's Disney World to me. It's, it's the closest we'll get to a theme park. My first time ever going to a Comic-Con, um, it was uh, right after my uncle had passed away, my uncle David, who uh, was really into comic books. He uh, introduced me to X-Men, the Hulk, Spider-Man. He introduced me to a lot of superheroes. He had been to prison a few times in my life and I would send him comics. He would draw them and send them back to me and I would frame them and I would uh, keep those drawings as a way to remember him and as a way to have fun while he was away. You know, um, Uncle always had a lot of energy and he always provided a lot of fun growing up. So when he passed away, I have reached out to Boston Comic Con, asked them for press passes so that I can do interviews. Uh, I wanted to interview creative people. You know, um, immediately when I saw the lineup of type of people that were going to be at the convention, um, I wanted to interview them. I wanted to ask questions. You know, there were going to be artists there, writers, fans that uh, dress up as these characters, watching people so enthusiastic and passionate about stories that they're designing, creating uh, costumes, um, and they're creating, recreating these characters, reinterpreting these characters, and they're living these characters. Comic Cons are always extremely powerful to me. You know, they're like a producer's gold mine because there's like endless amount of creativity, endless amount of passion. I want to ask you about your experience with art. My name is Jose Delbo. You know, I, as you know, you recognize my Boston accent. I was uh, born in Argentina, uh, South America, a long, long, long time ago. I started my f professional life. My first comic book or cartoon drawing was when I was 16 years old. Now I'm 82 years old. That means I've been doing the little pictures for a little while. It's been really interesting. Um... I'd always been creative, but even as a little kid, I drew. But I mean, I started working at three years old as an actor. Uh, I got my SAG card in 1974. So my whole life, in one way or the other, has been being an artist, or being communicating art in some type of way, um, whether it be through dance, through martial arts. I mean, I, I, I've been a professional. I was a professional athlete also growing up. So, I, I mean, I had toured with Gloria Estefan and, and, and danced with Michael Jackson and done all these awesome things. Uh, so I just think I had so many different ways of being an artist when I was growing up, thank God. We are going to meet Hulk Hogan. I've idolized the Hulkster since I was six or seven. I was into comic books, Ninja Turtles, and pro wrestling, and Hogan was like a superhero to me. And I'm finally going to get to meet him after 30 years, almost 30 years. Well, this is about to happen. I worked from a photograph from, uh, I think it was the days when he was working with Warrior, WrestleMania 6. And so I work in graphite pencil predominantly. And this is the only one, this is an original for him. No prints were made. This is strictly for the Hulkster. What's up, big brother? I saw that, man. That's very good, brother. Yeah, I saw that, man. That's strong. Thank you so much. It's very strong, man. I'm glad you like it. Wow, man. Uh, he loved my art. He remembered it from Twitter when I, I posted it last night, and he was very appreciative. I got this thing now where I love meeting the people that affected me in my life, like whether they're artists or celebrities or athletes, I like to draw them and give them presents of themselves as, you know, an illustrative form uh, as a thank you for affecting my life, you know, and, and moving me into where I'm at. Because well, all this, you know, I wouldn't have what I have today. I've been influenced by all things pop culture and it's shaped my life and it's made me who I am. You know, it's a big part of it. So, you know, it's the least I can do. But give back, give them a gift and say thank you for everything you've done. This is Mick with Jason. It never gets old when somebody uh, takes their time and talent uh, to depict you on uh, on any type of medium. It's always flattering, man, especially when it's this well done. Thank you. A lot of times you have to lie and tell people it's great when it's not, but this is really <laughs> great, man. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for finding your voice. Yeah, that's 
the heart. Of I'm still look, I'm still trying to find mine. I'm still trying to find mine, and I knew even at 44, sometimes you go, God, what the? I don't know what I'm gonna do, and you know, I think your your voice is that voice in you that's honest. You know, is the most honest, and when you can relay, and you could just be yourself and not exaggerate, not make anything up, and just be exactly who you are. I think that's when you have your voice, you know? And so, uh, I, I'm, I'm learning to find mine a little more than than, uh, uh, than I think I used to, and that, that maybe comes with age, I don't know. Uh, I had a real strong one when I was young, and then you think, you know, your paths go like this, and life happens, and, uh, and yeah, so, you know, learning to uh, really be an honest human being and stand up for your for yourself and, and make your make yourself and your voice heard that you know, it takes some balls and, and, it, and it, sometimes it takes people a while and it changes so it's important to do though there's a lot of other voices out there there are a lot of people that are going to say a lot of other things but that's not what informs you ultimately i mean there's a reason i i strongly believe that there's a reason we have the strong urges to do certain things, you know, to, to pursue certain things, um, the creative visions that we have. You were talking about how you put things down on, on and I think it's so important to put the, put things down. When I think when I get hit, I write, and when I get hit with ideas, whenever I can, if it's into my phone or whatever, I, I try to write things down because they go away and they, I think those things come to you for a reason and you, and you visualize, and there are a lot of things that in the past, ideas I had that I didn't follow through on that haunt me to this day. Because I'm, I, people said, I had naysayers around me, oh you can't do that, because I was acting, so people thought I couldn't direct, you know, they thought I couldn't, they didn't think of me as a writer, because I was, they knew me as one thing, so they were comfortable with that. I'm 23, I'm Chris Rivers, I'm who I am right now, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be the same person tomorrow, a year from now, I think you're always evolving and finding out who you are, but I think your voice is, it, it comes from a place of, um, of, ge of of genuineness, you know what I'm saying, like you have to be yourself, you can't be afraid, you get all these influences from other people in the world constantly telling you, you should be this, or you gotta do this, or you see someone else winning, doing something else, so you feel you need to sway, but I think the biggest thing is that you gotta understand that you can fail doing something that you don't want to do. You could fail doing something that, 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 that isn't you. So you might as well do the things that is true to you because I'd rather win as myself and fail as myself than, than win and potentially fail as who I'm not. And I think that's big. So you got you to be comfortable with yourself, accept your flaws, accept who you are, and try to transcend that. I have a lot of anxiety and I be paranoid all the time. I don't know why. It's just some, some issues. I, I, I don't know. I blame it on my childhood, but <laughs> I have a lot of issues. But, um... Being in front of the camera is so hard for me. Like, I can't believe I'm talking right now. Like, it's so hard for me. I'm like mad shy. It's like something comes over me. Being in the booth too, it's because it's one thing rapping a cappella, but it's like different when you're in the booth. Like, it sound, you sound different on the mic. You're like, wait, hold up. That's how I sound ill. Like, you got to like really adjust to the shit. So it's like, now you got to do it around mad people too. So it's like, the shit was like a shock, but I was ready for it. Like, I wasn't. I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna let the shot kill me like you know I'm gonna just jump back up so that's what I was doing and it's just like what's keeping me doing it is just like me knowing like that I got it you gotta really be your number one fan I put my I put myself on a bracket like I don't give a fuck I'm I'm up here not saying that I'm that you're here and I'm here you could be here too but I'm here <laughs> like you could be here too but I'm here just know for artists it's it's important to preserve what you do and not necessarily pull the curtain back um, not that we're I don't know not that we're we're trying to do people or, or anything but sometimes you don't need to see how the sausage is made you know there are things that that I access as an actor in my own performances that I don't necessarily need to tell other people so I think there's times where you know people could compromise their art that way you know, and their performance by just telling everybody what's going on in that regard. And I, I don't know that it's always the smartest thing. It could work for some people. It doesn't work for me. And uh, there are just very deep personal things. Look, I like to have a fun time. I like to have a great time with things. And then I do a performance where I maybe get into something pretty heavy and deep and they go, what, you know, I get asked, like, what, what were you thinking about with that? Man, that's none of your business. 
Like that's my personal thing. These are my own struggles and my own, you know, demons and things that I need to work through. You know, and then I'm able to share that through a performance, but I don't need to show you the process of buying the bread and the lunch meat and making the sandwich and all that. That's nobody's business. That's mine. You know, and sometimes you, you can come off as being kind of douchey or a diva by wanting to do that, but you know, or, or kind of having that point of view. But I, I think it's just really important to protect that. A lot of people too, they'll ask, you know, what kind of music do you listen to to help prep you for a role? I mean, it depends. I mean, for one role, I might be listening to this. The music I use for for Eugene on The Walking Dead is the type of the certain type of music I don't listen to. I also don't want to share that with people, you know. And then, then they know your tricks. <laughs> they can catch you on your crutch, and and that's something that you don't necessarily want to be in a, a position of. So, um, it's it's vitally important to to kind of protect your art as a performer. I don't know when my fascination for horror. Um, started. I don't know where it started. I don't know when it started. You know, I've always been in love with stories that could really aggravate emotions, um, like the way fear does. You know, fear taps into a real crazy part about being a human being. When you're scared, the adrenaline you're feeling in your chest, those reactions you get from being afraid, um, it's something that's always fascinated me. So. I've always looked up to, to horror writers, horror movies, horror films that um, really focused on people's fears and had fun with that, you know. Edgar Allan Poe, this is Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Bronx Cottage. This is his last uh, home, the last home that he actually lived in. He died in, in Baltimore, but he had family in Baltimore and he went back and forth between Baltimore, Virginia, and uh, the Bronx and Philadelphia. Um, so I've been to all his remaining homes, the one in Philadelphia, the one in Baltimore, and the one here in uh, the Bronx. I've been to um, the last place he was seen in public. I've been to the building where he died. Um, I walked past the room he died in. I've been to his grave site. His burial spot was switched, so he has two different grave sites in the same cemetery. Um, but I really respect the original gravesite where he was originally buried um, because that was his final resting place. And they only moved him because they realized how famous he was. And so many people try to rewrite his story. You know, I love Edgar Allan Poe because he was weird, he was different, he was ahead of his time. He, he was never fully uh, embraced by the people who lived with him. You know, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, wasn't really like that much and he lived in his own world and you know he still did his own thing and did things his way you know at his funeral there was only seven people that showed up but you know the people that tell the story later say his funeral was massive you know when his funeral only had a, a, so little people and it was raining the pastor even skipped the sermon so he had a real sad life he never got recognized the way he felt he should have, but he still did his thing and he still worked on art and created stories that exist to this day. We're here at uh, Nancy Thompson's house. This is the house from Freddy Krueger. The best story from that house for me is, I love the lady that owns it because that house is worth millions of dollars now. And one of the things about that house is it's the most photographed street in the world, but they don't change the cover of the front of the house. And they can get like $50,000 to rent that house for a day but she have to change the paint and she won't change it. So she every year she loses lots and lots of money because she keeps the house that way for the fans. When I go to Los Angeles, I also go to the house and I like to jump out from behind the bushes when the fans come and uh, I surprise, I've surprised one or two people there. So if you come to the house on Genesee and you see a guy lurking around with a glove, it's probably me. So just say hey and I'll take a picture of it. I brought my pillow, my Ninja Turtles pillow. These were some of my first heroes. I'm about to meet uh, Robert Englund. It's the man that played Freddy Krueger. That's insane. I brought my uh, Ninja Turtles pillow. I slashed it, added some blood to it. Let's see what happens with the dad. Robert, how you doing? Yo, this is my pillow. Oh, your pillow growing up. No, I just did. Uh, the voiceover on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the That's Evil Beaver. Freddy Krueger and Chucky and Jason, they were all introduced to me around the same time. 
as the Ninja Turtles and Roger Rabbit. And this house looks exactly the way it did in the movies, so I'm excited to be here. It's so funny because I used to park in front of that house before I ever did Nightmare on Elm Street. So I, that I used to park right where you're sitting because no my union, the Screen Actors Guild for the actors, is right up on the corner on Sunset. When I did Freddy vs. Jason, uh, there was a house just like that in Vancouver and I thought they built it. Oh, wow. I thought they constructed it for the movie. And the guy said to me, no, no, no. He goes, we found this. It's just like this. So somewhere all over the country, it's, a, it's the same architect. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get your, your thoughts on this image. I mean, to this day, that is my favorite villain of all time. Do you know how the Shredder was created? No, you can tell me that story. Go yeah, for you it. Love this. So it was a working through the origin, um, the rat, and turtles, and I guess exposed to ooze, and you know, little isms from our favorite comic books. Um, and then uh, we're doing dishes one night, and because uh, Pete's wife was a fantastic cook, and Pete would wash, and I'd usually try. So one night I'm drying one of those cheese graters, you know, those metal kind of triangular cheese graters with a handle on it. So I'm drying this, I kind of slide my hand up inside it, and I'm holding the handle on the top with the grater going like this, and I'm like, Man, could you imagine a bad guy with like this as a weapon? He would like literally grate your skin off. You know, we could call, you know, our bad guy like the grater or something. And Pete said, well, how about the shredder? And uh, we were like, yeah, that's cool. So the shredder came from doing dishes. My name is Steve Levine. Uh, I work on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, I've been doing it for 32, 33 years. How did you guys come up with the concept of, you know, you know what, we're just going to have them be so in love with pizza? I think that just came from, that was the treat, you know? If you're eating Kraft macaroni and cheese and ramen noodles and you can afford a pizza at the end of the week, pizza was the, the bonus, you know, so. How long have you guys been in the pizza business? So I was born under an oven. Father started a pizza place uh, back in the 80s, and been doing it pretty much uh, off and on ever since. Uh, was it 19, I think it was 1980, 1981. And then I bought this place in, uh, in uh, 2008. So, I've had about six, seven jobs uh, delivering pizza, Chinese food. My boy Joseph Rivers, he had a really dope idea. He was like, yo, we should bring pizza to the Ninja Turtles. So, today, we're bringing cheese pizza to Michelangelo and Donatello. What's up, fellas? Ah. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> oh, right! I am totally gonna have a slice of pizza. Are you kidding? Do you have any napkins with you by any chance? Oh, we gotta get some napkins. I'll go get some yeah. paper towel. Get it. Separate this. Oh, sh oh my god. Check it out. Cowabunga, dude. Come on, slice, hon. I would love a you slice. Got it. Did you guys bring it? Yes. Thank you. You guys are so, thank you. Being an actor, Where was you it? do jobs and you have work and you do it and you have fun and then you move on. And most of the time, it was just an event and it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. And this is 25 years later where people come up to me, if not every day, almost every day, and tell me how much the experience meant to them. And so I had my experience and it was lovely and I still get to see my friends from the movie and I, but I get this other experience that has to do with the fans and their experience 25 years later. And that is an experience I never, imagined and it's really special and so I have this ongoing morphing developing relationship with something I did so long ago and it it keeps reinventing itself as a gift over and over and over again. Oh, this is from the original This is uh, Craig's house from Friday. This is what it looks like today. 2016. I don't this ain't 
I don't play them bitch ass roles. That's why I'm gonna just leave it like that. I'm the fool. I don't wear no makeup either. Give me a bicycle. Give me a pickup truck. I'll run your ass over. This is the, the murder house of American Horror Story. From season one. All I needed to do was see the first episode of this series and I was hooked. The gravesite of Marilyn Monroe. On my study tours, I've, uh, I guess on my journeys, I've always made a habit of stopping by cemeteries um, and visiting grave sites uh, for energy. You know, I, you know, I was obsessed with I Love Lucy growing up. I loved it. I knew I'd never meet her, but going to her tomb, um, going to her grave site was as close as I was going to get to meeting her. Um, maybe meeting her kids would be awesome. But going to the grave site, I go that I go there and. I can reflect, I can think, I can do nothing, but at the very least, I try and get some energy, say hello. It's the witch school from American Horror Story. This is awesome. This is the house from Wonder Years, the Wonder Years house. <laughs> uh, most of the action from Halloween was film here while she was babysitting Tommy, Michael Myers. My study tours have always been something that's been real deep in my heart. In the fourth grade, my teacher, Miss Hensel, introduced me to the, the map of America. It was 50 states, it was blank, and uh, she told us we had to fill in all 50 states and she challenged us to fill in all 50 states. And when I asked Miss Hensel, where's Boston? Miss Hensel showed me this little dot on the map. And I'm just like, man, so everything I was telling her, all the places that I knew, she was telling me it was all Boston. She kept pointing at Boston. I'm like, man, this world is so big. There's so much that I don't know about. You know, so it, it, it made, the it crack my head open. I was in the fourth grade when I was introduced to that map. You know, so going on the road has always been in my heart. You know, my father's a delivery driver, my mother's an educator. Between the two of them, you know, going on the road and learning, they both rubbed off on me. My father is not afraid to drive anywhere, and he instilled that in me. Um, I'm not afraid to drive anywhere on the planet that I can plug into my GPS. And my mother is, is an educator, so she, she always took us on, on trips on the road when we were younger to learn about things. She took us to Philadelphia, to the Independence Hall. She took us to the Lincoln Memorial, to the White House. Um, she took us to Niagara Falls. My mom was big on learning your history and knowing your history, um, which has made me extremely inquisitive. I wasn't born a skeptic, but I always did have a lot of questions, and a lot of kids in school called me stupid for asking so many questions, you know, and uh, it's funny that I've made a name for myself for asking questions. I'm about to interview Sid Haig, Captain Spaulding, this guy, uh, has the unique capacity to make me tremble. This guy scares me and makes me nervous. Um, I mean, he's just a regular dude, but he plays a very scary character, so I wanna go talk to him right now. Did, did you have any insecurities that maybe like maybe the world don't know about, like uh, 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 insecurities um, that you struggled with throughout your life? When I was a kid, yeah, and I reached puberty. <laughs> And, and I, heard, I, I had a circus going on inside my pants, but I couldn't get a date. I went through my entire school years without a date. Uh, and then I don't know what happened. I got on stage when I went to the Pasadena Playhouse, which was a, a, a theater arts college, okay? And the first time I got on stage and worked, all of a sudden, women started paying attention to me. I don't know why, I'm the same guy I always was, but for some reason that part of me came out and it caused some kind of attraction, I don't know, it's crazy. I just protected my art by doing it, okay? And that's the thing that keeps me healthy. When I'm working, I'm healthy, right? People don't believe uh, that uh, I'm as old as I am, 
um, only because it just uh, the whole thing just keeps me energized and young and healthy and moving forward all the time. You know, you got to take care of yourself. Here came Scott comes in, caught her to f up my interview. Watch out. <laughs> no, you put him up to that. She told me to do it. I know she did. She said, go meet with this interview. There's actually an escape room. I think they're in Florida. I'm sorry, I just don't think it's a favorite. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that's tough when you're younger, sometimes opportunity comes before you really know yourself. You know, that's really hard. You know, like I had, I knew that I was really good at what I did, but I didn't, you know, everybody wanted to see more of me in it, but I didn't know what that was, even in my 20s. So, you know, you, you know the, the old adage, youth is wasted on the young. I mean, because you really know yourself as you're older, but then you don't get as many opportunities when you're older because it's a young person's game. They write more parts for younger people. They give more opportunities to younger people. They pay more money to younger people, but you know, if you really, really learn to discover yourself and know that you're enough. That, that was, I think, one of the reasons why I didn't know myself so well. I didn't know, think that I was enough. I didn't think that I was enough that would be interesting enough to get cast as this character. I thought I had to make him more of a character. I, think, I thought I had to make him more interesting. I, think I had to make him sound funny and I had to do, you know. But guess what? They just wanted to see me be real, me be alive, and have a moment that they could capture, you know? And uh, that was something that I had to learn early in my career, and sometimes it was a little late for that. But, uh, you know, obviously it wasn't too late because you know, I've been able to maintain you know, my career for all these years, so. When you come to these conventions, what you realize is these conventions, when I first started coming to, they scared me because the people looked so mean and like tough and everything. And then I realized at one point they're all just a bunch of dorks. You know what I mean? Like, but they like are dorks who let themselves be themselves. And these are the sweetest, nicest people in the world. You know, and they look a little rough. But and for me it was like you know, of course, sexuality. I felt different, and I felt like I was the only person in the world that was me. But I was a lucky boy because I realized when I was I don't know 12 or 13, I realized there was nothing wrong with me. There was wrong with something wrong with the people around me, and I just needed to get away from them. Do you know what I mean? And as soon as I got away from them, I was like, I'm fine, you know. I'm like cool. So I am cool, you know. So uh, I don't like football, but that's you know I don't have to watch it. You know what I'm saying? And I don't have to pretend I like it either, you know. So there you go. That's that was my big secret. It took me a while to feel secure enough to do dialogue because doing stunts came naturally for me. I mean, I was always doing dangerous things to entertain my friends and stuff like that. So doing stunts was a natural thing. Going into acting was far more of a challenge. And uh, since I hadn't been trained in it at all, it was a little more difficult. And I really had to overcome some insecure feelings about doing that. So basically this is the early VIP admittance for uh, the Stan Lee and the 3D three-day pass holders. Um, so we sold 400 Stan Lee VIPs and then we sold 600 uh, three-day pass VIPs. So these people are all waiting to come in and they get to come in to the, enjoy the show uh, half an hour early. And they get speed passes to go see all the guests and they also get free t-shirts, free programs and everything. Why do you come to Comic Con? Well I'm coming to this Comic Con for, for the man. Stan Lee, spending the big bucks, got to see him. I've always wanted to go to Comic Con and this year I finally was able to and it's really exciting because this is just so cool and I get to cosplay too so that's awesome. What was that like picking on a cosplay? That must be awesome. It was hard because I had a few in mind and then my friends were doing those so then I was like well I'm gonna do a different one and so I picked one that none of my friends knew about but it was really easy and fun for me because I love Miss Marvel and she's from Boston so kind of keeping it to home.
my name is Jesse Farrell and I'm a sculptor and I live in Massachusetts and uh, I make mostly superhero sculptures. Well, how do you go about developing this, this art here? Uh, well, let's see, when I was a kid, um, I always read, I read comic books and played with toys and uh, back then they didn't have um, all the toys that they do today, like all the, all the comic book characters and stuff like that, so I had to make my own action figures. And uh, when I got older, I got more interested in just sort of uh, the sculpting aspect and then the than the playing with toys aspect. So I just started making uh, my own sculptures and uh, trying to do characters that are underrepresented and, and you don't see all the time, uh, or or fun stuff like Batman fighting a dinosaur. My name's Mike Doherty, they call me Sherpa. I draw stuff because I have to, I do this every day. Beyond just doing art here at cons and things like that, I'm also a high school art teacher, so I get to tap into it in my professional career also. So I, I make stuff all the time and I try to instill that want to make things in other people. When I was in college, I studied anthropology. So I started learning about cultures. Then when I started learning about cultures, uh, I started to see, you know, their art seemed to reflect, obviously, uh, their ways of life. So when I started studying that, my roommate was into comics and it kind of got me back into it. And to make a long story short, this has become not just a career, but I travel with my family. So it influences where we go. Uh, what we do together. So we actually end up spending a lot more time together. Even though I'm busy, we're spending a lot more time together and we're, I guess, closer as a family because of the art. I'd like to introduce Mr. Stanley. Tell you the story of how Spider-Man started, if you haven't heard it. I had already done the Fantastic Four, and I think maybe either the X-Men or the Hulk or something, and my publisher said, come up with something else. I want another superhero. So I went home and I tried to think of something else. And I saw a fly crawling on the wall. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be cool to have a hero like an insect who could crawl on walls or stick to the ceiling? Now, I'm not telling the truth. I probably didn't say, wouldn't it be cool? In say, those days, I probably said, wouldn't it be groovy? But you get the idea. And I, um, I finally thought, that's what I'll do. So I tried to get a name. And I thought, insect man, didn't sound good. Mosquito man, I don't know, I went down the list and I got to Spider-Man and it sounded kind of mysterious and dramatic. And I thought I'd make him a teenager so that the teenage readers could relate to him. And then to make it more fun, I thought I'd give him a lot of personal problems. He didn't have a girlfriend in the beginning. He didn't have enough money. He worried about his aunt. I thought that was a good idea, so I brought it to my publisher and I told him. And my publisher, in his wisdom, said to me, that is the worst idea I have ever heard. He said, first of all, people hate spiders, so you can't call a hero Spider-Man. He said, next, I don't know where to sign this. Where? Where? Right there. All right. He said, you, you can't make him a teenager. A teenager can only be a sidekick. And you want him to have problems? Stan, superheroes don't have problems. That's why they're superheroes. So I left the office with my tail between my legs. I was really brokenhearted. But we had a book that we were about to kill called Amazing Fantasy. And when you're going to kill a book, nobody cares what you put in the last issue. So just to get it out of my system, I put a Spider-Man story in amazing fantasy and featured it on the cover and forgot about it. A month later, when the sales figures came in, amazing fantasy had been our best-selling book with Spider-Man on the cover. So my publisher called me into the office and he said, Stan, do you remember that character of yours, Spider-Man, that we both loved so much? <laughs> I swear. He said, let's make him a series. And that's how Spidey was born.
In Boston, we have a few cultural events that we look forward to every year. One of them is the Puerto Rican Festival. Growing up, the Puerto Rican Festival was mostly a parade, and then we had a big festival on the field. Um, it was a big, huge field. We had rides and a big concert. That festival is now held in Boston City Hall, and um, this year, um, the organizers from the Puerto Rican Festival asked me to bring some entertainment, and Spider-Man was one of the characters that uh, um, we had there. We had an Elsa, we had Ariel, we had Cell, we had a Power Ranger. I'm a filmmaker. I'm, this is just an extension of what I do. As a kid, I almost lost my life chasing uh, Roger Rabbit in a Disney parade. You know, I saw Roger Rabbit and I ran right into the street. Um, I was five years old, so I know the power of seeing a character from a movie or from television um, right in front of you. So it's um, one way for me to be able to give back and uh, give memories to kids and the same weekend I was working on the Boston Comic Con and uh, the Puerto Rican Festival you know so Saturday Sunday are both packed with events you know so at the same time as the Puerto Rican Festival it was the, the first time one of my documentaries was being screened um, so Boston Comic Con was hosting a documentary I filmed called Cartoon and Comics. Everybody introduce this. This is very, very exciting. <laughs> I want to introduce myself. Um, oh, this way. <laughs> I would love to introduce myself. My name is Dante Luna. I'm a 27 year old filmmaker photographer from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm from Rosendale. Um, High Park High graduate. And uh, I finished my bachelor's degree before I was 20 years old in, in philosophy. But while I was studying philosophy, uh, I started asking myself what I wanted to do with my life. I thought I wanted to go to law school. I thought I wanted to go to business school. But then philosophy really started asking, making me ask questions about where I saw myself in the future. At the time, I had my YouTube account. So my YouTube numbers were going up and my college bills were going up. <laughs> so I, the first time I heard someone say, how much for a video, I never looked back and I started taking my art, that was a hobby, turned it into a, a career. I've taken him to several states. I met him in Houston, his, his first time in Boston. You know, it's, it's I've seen my dreams come to life just taking my creative energy serious. I know, that was pretty cool. It's, it's cool to just to see a room full of people ready to watch. Oh man. Hold up. Yesterday, day one, Roddy Roddy Piper passed away. Day two, my man Superman brings a sign here. Make some homage to Roddy Piper. Go back uh, to the Puerto Rican festival to so check in on the children's event. Um, did it. I was able to do the film festival, now I'm late to the... Now I gotta go to City Hall Plaza to go check in on the children's event, see how everything's going. These experiences have always been fun. Comic Cons are always fun, I always walk away learning something. You know? And it's, it's fun because you get to see people's art. You know, a lot of times, or nowadays, we live in a time where um, people are trying to get more popular with their lifestyle as an artist and they're not showcasing their art. Right side, guys. Here's a chance. I like these events because you really get to see people's art, you get to see people do their thing.
All right, my first guest is Dante Luna. He's a 27-year-old Puerto Rican Dominican freelance filmmaker, photographer from Boston, who says that as a filmmaker, some of his most successful, most creative, and most rewarding work has been done at comic book conventions, such as Comic-Con. Now, it's at these events that he has met multi-talented performers, such as the lovely Carly Wynn, who's on his left. She also joins us this morning. She is an official cosplay. What is a cosplay? What's the definition of a cosplay? So, someone who looks like a particular character and then acts like that character. Now, you guys are pretty much not just characters. You guys are actors, right? Actors and actresses, right? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta act a little. How did you guys all connect? I mean, I know the, the conventions is one place, but... Well, Comic-Cons in general are convention, like, they're more like fan expos. You know, people bring um, movie stars, television stars, uh, comic book stars, um, you know, comic book artists and, you know, and, and, and fans as well. People who are falling in love with these stories and, um, you know, we all share this common interest. We're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> I, mate, how Captain are you? Jack. Nice to see you. How, how are you? Good. Good. Not interrupting anything. Hello, mate. Nothing Hello, important. Hello, darling. Nothing important. <laughs> May I have a seat? Uh, you, you want to have a seat? You want to have a I book? I would love to. Have, you know, I'm going to just take this because no one's looking. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a beautiful apartment you have. Congratulations on the upgrade. Yeah, yeah. We got the room in the back. Yeah, I'm in the wrong room, man. <laughs> <laughs> what did I miss? Uh, well, we would... Hello. How are you, sweetie? We were just talking about uh, your appearance, uh, upcoming appearance at Fenway Park on August 30th. Ridiculously excited. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to have my entire crew there, about 20 pirates, 20, 30 pirates strong, going to be invading Fenway for this. Can't wait for it. This is going to be great. This is August 30th at Fenway Park. You're going to be there. And uh, oh, I'm, I'm so, now I'm excited. See? I am too. I'm terribly excited. I don't even know why. The news room. I'm not very good at skipping. Hello, everyone. We're interrupting what you're doing. I hope there are no hurricanes going on. <laughs> Hello! How are you, sir? What have we got going on? Oh, the news is happening. The news is happening. Am I in it? <laughs> what, what have you done? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. I don't remember. <laughs> We're texting someone. <laughs> He's texting someone. Very oh, this is fun. He's up. He's up. I'm leaving. Are we videotaping? <laughs> We're doing Videotape. Shows my age. How are you today? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got chips to pillage. Have a good evening, everyone. Can we get a selfie? What? <laughs> Sheesh. A selfie? You mean an ussie. An ussie. Do pirates smile? Yes. I mean, I can. <laughs> Your choice. James. Say, arg. Oh, let me see you do it. I did. <laughs> that, that was, That's why I don't You just play said the letter R. Oh, that wasn't really a, an arg. Let's do it again. Hold on. We'll do a good arg. Okay. Stand by. Ready? One, two, two three. Ah, oh, oh. there you go. That was an er, <laughs> but that was much better. You're getting there. I was born in 1990, a couple years before um, Power Rangers was released in America. Um, I was about, I think, two or three years old when Power Rangers uh, first came out. And ever since then, I would wake up every Saturday morning watching it um, on TV, in my pajamas, bowl of cereal ready. And um, ever since then, and then I came out with the Power Rangers Zio and then the Turbo, and it just became um, just one of my favorite shows and pretty much like an addiction to me. Cars I got to Fenway, and um, you know, we're about to set them up. We're gonna go for a spin. We're gonna check out Boston. We're gonna let Boston know we're here. We're gonna introduce them to the DeLorean, reintroduce them to the DeLorean, the Scooby machine, the, the mystery machine and uh, the Ghostbusters car, so it's pretty cool, you know. I'm excited about it. I've been dying to sit in this car. Man, I'm, I'm excited, man. Not they approached me a little while back saying, we gotta do this up here, so you know what? <laughs> I take care of my man here. We're gonna come in, we're bringing the cars. Dante is hooking us up with a beautiful spot inside. Yes. Gonna make it all happen. So all right, Eric, for the people who never met you before. Yo, if you've never met me before, you're missing out on a lot. I'm gonna call myself the, uh, I don't know, movie movie car king. <laughs> but we have all kinds of cars, and up here today, we're gonna be having everything going on with the Scooby-Doo van, the Ghostbusters, and the Back to the Future DeLorean. I've gotta take you back in time with this unbelievable <laughs> prop from the movie. 
And we just gotta unlock the gas cap and get ourselves set up to put some gas in this beauty. It's a 1981 DeLorean. Uh, they made it for two and a half years, 81, 82, and 83. The last few were the ones that were brought over from Ireland after the molds were broken and destroyed. And uh, there's probably about, I'm gonna guess, there's probably about four to 5,000 of them around, if that. Uh, this is one of the prop cars from the movie. It was also used in the movie Arthur with Nick Nolte, Russell Brand, and Jennifer Garner. And we get to have a lot of fun. I was just with Claudia Wells in Chicago two days ago doing an event with her. We work with Christopher Lloyd from the movie. And you know what? I'm just very fortunate and blessed to be able to have these cars. I love bringing them out so everybody can see them and enjoy them also. Man, we had the festival. It's Leon Poe from the Celtics, team ambassador, OA champion. I'm here with the Power Ranger. My son used to like him. He still like the Power Ranger right now. I used to watch the Power Ranger back in the day. Now I don't, but it's okay. We still cool, right? All good. See, all love here at the festival. We, we getting it in. Since I first put on the makeup, it's a very Joker line right there. Uh, I don't know, it's just been fun. It's been crazy, it's been epic, a lot of people love it, I love the smiles, it's, yeah, it's really it, it's just a lot of fun. More people should do this, and I not gotta... stab me in the eye. <laughs> oh. Get is not good sight. That's the half that makes sense. Turn around. That's the half I don't know what to do with yet. Get out of my face, Joker. Which one? Hi, my ex-wife. My card. And I need to talk to you about the socioeconomic inequality that this state has faced. Sounds good, Joker. Not just the city, the state. Thank you for coming. This guy isn't even in my universe. You're a good guy. I like him. I like him better than that one. How about those superheroes, huh? I just want to come and just wish everyone a beautiful day today. It always seems like when Armando does an event, it's sunny and hot out, so I don't know how they pull it together, and I want to congratulate them for that. But I want to thank all of you for coming today. Enjoy today. Today is a very special day in the city of Boston, particularly for the Latino community. God bless you all, and thank you for being here. The Latino Festival is just a, a really is a great event that El Mundo puts together. Um, it's meant for families. We, we really want to celebrate our culture, our music, with our families and uh, you know what you and your friends and the people who came here with you today did was made it all that much better, right? Like I think there's going to be a young person who's going to show up not expecting you know to, to bump into Elsa from Frozen and they're just going to geek out and you're going to bring a smile that day and they're going to be talking about it for a while and they may not know Dante did it but they're going to know what happened today. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So that's We're going right now to the broadcast booth and this is where all the media, so we've got all these booths for different medias and we're going to go to the Spanish language one. Do a little promo with Yuri. Hey. So my man, how are you? How are you? Very Oh, gracias. Muchas gracias. And we're going to go right in here. He, this is my real life superhero. What was the significance of the Red Sox retiring uh, Pedro Martinez's number? Well, for me personally, I mean, obviously, you know, I can give you the same answer that any uh, Latino would give you. I mean, we got, you, we're extremely proud. But for me, I got to know Pedro very well. He's, uh, he, he was very impactful in my career. So he's, uh, he holds a very special place in my heart, not just as a ball player, and yes, he's, you know, arguably the greatest ever. But um, I have the honor of getting to know a lot of these guys real well, and he's one of the guys that I will forever be very thankful uh, for. And um, and seeing his number be retired, you know, uh, it's special. I mean, I don't think they can say it any better, any other way. It, it's truly special. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, 
please welcome number 45. as a little leaguer to go and represent the Dominican Republic and a lot of the Dominican people that are here know how much it means to a lot of you know some of us that, that could get that moment to go represent your country and because I didn't have twelve dollars twelve dollars at that time I did not represent my country and I had to wait until the second World Baseball Classic to put the Dominican Republic uniform on to go and represent my country and that stuck in my heart forever. And that's why I said, if I ever make it, if I ever make it, and I, I'm in position to send anybody over from the Dominican Republic, anywhere in the world, and open that door, that baseball opened for me, and because of that I'm here, means the opportunity I was given, I was granted by God and, and baseball to do something about the society and about the, the people that really need it, that people that are less fortunate than most of us. If I ever saw myself in, in, in the position to do that, I wanted to do it. And I waited since I was 12 years old, pretty much like this kid. I want to bring him up. How old are you? You 10. But, but you know what I'm talking about. Two years older, and I never, I never forgot, I never forgot that I wasn't able to represent my country because I, I didn't have, on average, twelve dollars to represent my country. And now today, I'm standing here. You know why? Because I want to give those kids the same opportunity baseball gave me, which is come over here, make a better person out of myself, be a father be a, a, a role model to society. See these kids, how they look at me? That's a hero right there. That's a <laughs> right. So right now I'm about to leave Fenway. I'm about to leave Fenway Park and I'm going uh, to go visit the gravesite of uh, Babe Ruth. Um, you know, they said uh, growing up my whole life that we'd never win any championship because of uh, Babe Ruth curse. And uh, in my lifetime, I've been able to see the Red Sox win three times. I just got to uh, Babe Ruth's gravesite. I'm gonna leave my baseball. I'm gonna sign it. I spent a lot of time visiting cemeteries. And I come with love, I come with respect. They say you die twice. When you stop breathing, second time you die, is when the last person says your name. If you stop saying someone's name, then they die for real. I believe life should be celebrated in birth and in death. Visiting people at the cemetery uh, has become a big part of my life. In that moment when we're visiting, when you're visiting that person, you're the only one in the world, you know, that's there with them. So the moment seems personal. It seems like uh, I had a moment alone with them. I visit people that I are no longer here but, but inspired me. Um, Babe Ruth, I love Babe Ruth's story. And even though I'm a diehard Boston fan, um, I love Babe Ruth's story. You know, Sandlot was one of my favorite movies in the world. You know, those kids looked up to Baby Ruth. Babe Ruth, the great Bambino, the Sultan of Swat, the Colossus of Clout. You know, so this is somebody that, you know, I grew up loving baseball and being Dominican, you know, baseball is something that we digest regularly, you know, and Babe Ruth was probably the first big baseball figure that I ever knew about. Um, my dad really liked the Babe Ruth movie with John Goodman. Um, he watched it all the time. My dad always watched Babe Ruth. I'm going to leave my uh, my baseball. I was just at Fenway Park today, and uh, I knew I was going to be working in New York the same day. I'm about to go work with Star Reels right now. We're going to be uh, 
going over a game plan to film a few music videos. So before I go see uh, Star in the Bronx, I had to see the Bronx Bomber, Babe Ruth. I'm leaving my baseball. I love, I mean, I love baseball. I have so many of them. So I'm leaving one of my baseballs for Babe Ruth. I love my study toys. My study toys are a way for me to learn and package my culture, preserve my culture. Um, it's a way for me to go back to school. I finished my bachelor's degree when I was 20 years old and this is my way of educating myself. I visited all five Great Lakes. That was really, really uh, a lot of fun for me. Going to Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. I photographed 37 or 50 states. I've been working on that for five years. It's my way of teaching myself. You know, as you can tell, I'm a geek, and uh, I'm not afraid to be a geek. I'm not afraid of being a nerd. I love learning. Learning has made life more interesting. It makes every day different because I'm willing to write new pages. I'm willing to add new chapters to my life um, just by being open to learning and open to loving. I'm a real, real simple dude. You know, real low maintenance. I spend my money on gas and uh, white t-shirts. GPS, one of the best inventions ever. I didn't have GPS on my first road trip. I was 18 years old, I drove from Boston to Miami with my little cousin. I see home is home, that's where I'm happy. get ideas at home all the time, you know, but there's an urge in me to take my ideas to the world and, and go continue to do what I do. That's all I can describe it as. I like documenting, you know, natural wonders, you know, stuff that reminds you that, you know, life is beautiful, um, that life is, you know, a gift, you know, like the Grand Canyon and, um, you know, that, that stuff that Mother Nature designed, you know, stuff like that, you know, drives me crazy. I like historical stops. The story of America is told in many, many chapters. Um, you know, I love documenting indigenous people, people who called America home before we called it home, um, you know, and then I like pop culture destinations, you know, movie destinations, uh, television, and, and, and uh, fun stuff. This is a pop culture destination, um, the Home Alone house. I'm really, really excited. It's someone's home right now. Like somebody's living in it, you know, so 
can't really get too comfortable, but you, we can stop and park across the street and uh, take some pictures. Um, it's pretty cool being here. You know, don't be afraid to take leaps. You can't be afraid to take a leap. You know, you can't be afraid to uh, take chances. Um, there's a lot to see outside of the place you called home. Not to say there's anything wrong with home. I feel like I bring a lot of uh, jewels back home. You know, I travel and then I learn stuff and I bring it back home. I focus on interviewing artists. I love learning from creative people, from people who aren't afraid to be vulnerable and show the world their creations. Artists to me, no matter what kind of artist it is, it, you know, it could be a painter, a sculptor, a photographer, uh, you know, a director, you know, a performing artist, you know, the, these are people who are bringing ideas to life and are expressing themselves in ways for people to remember, um, you know, and, and stories are a big part of my life, you know, you know, and stories are told by artists, you know, the people who put the stories together, the people who express those stories, those are all artists. You know, my life has been heavily influenced by creative people. With greatness, you have to accept the fact that you will be insecure. That there does come depression, it comes sadness, it comes hard work. Because while you're shooting for the highest, you have to realize that good is right there. As, as If this is great, good is right here. So as you shooting past good to get to great, you realize good is behind you. And you, you start rationalizing in your brain like, I could settle for this. I could settle for good. I could fall back and settle for good. But once you once you really think about that, me personally, I, I, could, get a, I could get a nine to five. I could thrive in those situations because the hustle and the grind and the consistency that you need to be great is, is, is monumentally greater than, than what you need to be good. So I could thrive as a good, but it doesn't mean that I'll be satisfied. I would have sell myself short in this one life that I get. You know what I'm saying? So you have to not only accept that you're trying to be great, but you also have to accept everything that comes with it. Not only the good, but the trials, the tribulations, the obstacles, and you have to constantly overcome. You got to know what it means to be brave and to be strong. It doesn't mean that you're fearless, and it doesn't mean that you that that, that you've that you vanquished all fears. It means that you can stand up in the face of fear and keep going no matter what. And I think that's what a lot of people don't know. And, and your insecurities will come. Your insecurities will come, but you got to fight through them and believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself no one else will it's hard for anybody to have like rejection and that was one thing that i think was a little insecurity for me you know it was like ah, i don't know if i want to do this audition because you know you're always afraid of being turned down but in this business in any business it doesn't really matter man like you have to like believe in yourself and take those insecurities out and believe it or not it's it's, it's even i've never said this before but looking at your face man on the big screen you know, like cricket teeth on the bottom, like you pick yourself apart, even though other people might not see it. Uh, even when I MMA fight, you know, I'm taking my shirt off and I'm like, you know, you, you, there's insecurities. You know, there's a lot of people that walk around and you think that, you know, here's the confidence and stuff, but I'm just being real with you guys. Like I can sit there and say whatever, but those, I think insecurities of failing, that I won't fail, I can't fail, I'm not gonna stop. Those are the things that I believe um, strongly in, not if the ifs. I don't believe in ifs. What if you weren't the Green Ranger? There's no ifs, we're just wasting time. You know what I mean? What if I'm successful? Not if, you will be. And that's the thing. And you know in the same world that you're in, you know, keep growing and growing and keep striving to be the best you can. So I would say that would probably be an insecurity of mine. My insecurities I used to fuel me. Not to, not to take me down because you have to fight against your insecurities every day. Nobody, I don't care who, how people come off or how you know, positive or whatever they come off, everyone's insecure. Everybody has something that they feel less than about. But you have to embrace yourself and empower yourself. If you don't think you're the best, if you don't feel that you're the greatest in anything, in just in life, as a person, as, as a human, as how you treat others, in, in your art, in your, with your family, if you embrace that and use that and know and wake up and tell yourself how great you are and tell yourself that you have a finite time here you'll fight those insecurities all day so for me it's just I know the greatest thing that's ever helped me is that I know that I have a minimal amount of time here and that I want to leave a bit of a dent in this world I have to because I, I just don't have a lot of time to do that even if I live till 120 I don't have a lot of time it's a very short amount of time so um, insecurities are just the thing accept it move forward and that's it. And don't don't rest in them. Move forward. Just keep moving forward. That's all that matters. 
when I landed my first audition, right, it was for Snatch, right, uh, to play Tommy. But at the time, I was only 32, right, I'm 45 now, but I couldn't read or write. And it wasn't long ago, I'm a heavy dyslexic now, but it, it, it hindered me, you know? Sometimes I'd shake going into the bank, filling the form in. Sometimes I couldn't even fill my own name in, right? But don't worry about it, right? It just means you're very special if you've got dyslexia, right? You've got to learn a different way to learn things, you know what I mean? Make draw pictures to words and things like that. I just stick at it and stick at it and stick at it. And if you've got it in school, don't worry about it because it's a good time. Don't hide it in and don't mess about. Tell them what your disabilities are and they'll help you, yeah? Try harder um, is really about empowering people to reach their full potential. I feel like I'm lucky that I had art in my life. I'm lucky, I feel, I feel blessed that I have an outlet, you know, I believe life is just a combination of good days and bad days and I have a place to put my negative energy or energy that could break me down or could be destructive you know I I use my creative energy to, to to write new pages and new chapters in my life you know um, right now I love movies and I love television I love comic books and it's been the best way for me to experience life and live life to the fullest you know it's more than just an expression to me it's become how I live my life you know um, I battled with self-injury you know most of my life um, and heightened points of anxiety uh, I, I would hurt myself to get rid of the pain and you know and I thought that was normal for most of my life and um, you know me taking a step back from creating and taking a step back from um, just being a workaholic because I love to work you know and just living life and learning more about myself and you know I have no problem taking you know earnings from a wedding and driving really far with it just to take pictures um, you know that's what what's become of me I guess and I guess you know I, I focused a lot about inner dialogue and empowerment and, and insecurities because you know, I think we all have insecurities uh, I think we all have things that um, will hinder our success and can hinder us from being better people and hinder us from fully being who we're destined to be. You know, um, some of those insecurities are things that are with us, and, and some of those things are qualities or traits that we can get through. Um, you know, I guess the important thing is to uh, just look yourself in the mirror and look inward. Ask yourself what you love about life. Uh, you know, find a way to deal with negative energy, because negative does exist. You know, there's good and evil in this world, and you know, there's, you're gonna have good days and bad days. I've never met a, an old person that said life was perfect, so um, there are gonna be bad days. You know, I tattooed "Try Harder." six seven years ago and then I made a t-shirt about it and I sold a lot of t-shirts you know and I saw a lot of fitness people responding to me and a lot of educators responding and um, you know it wasn't try harder it isn't about me it really is about the person who can relate to the shirt or relate to the phrase um, you know and they can see how that works for them and how saying those type of works, words like try hard or try harder you know how that works encourages them to, to continue pushing their dream you know.
know, I, I, I don't believe we have to live life in agony and pain, um, confused. I meet a lot of people who are older than me and they're well rested and, and confused and I just hope that's never me, you know. Um, I'm restless and extremely focused and I'm fighting for, for rest. I guess that's my next big goal is to Im improve my health and to live as long as I can and continue to be a dad, um, a good family man, and continue to add to the world around me. You know, proud that I'm from Boston, proud that I'm from Rosendale. There's a big world out there. The globe is big. You know, there's a lot of resources and means to go about traveling at low cost. So. You know, I would say make some money, find ways to make money, you know, and fund your ideas, you know, and then see what that does for your smile and what that does for your, for your life. And hopefully that's contagious and that multiplies and you can inspire the people around you.